Okay, now we come to the next sutta, 91. The section uh, is uh, on the Brahmins, uh, Brahmana Vaga. Uh, so there's a few interesting suttas here. 91 is Brahma Yu Sutta. Brahma Yu. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering in the country of the Videhans with a large Sangha of monks, with 500 monks. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Brahmayu was living at Mithila. He was old, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, and come to the last stage. He was in his one, he was in his hundred and twentieth year. He was a master of the three Vedas with their vocabularies, liturgy, phonology, and etymology, and the histories as a fifth. Skilled in philology and grammar, he was fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. Stop here for a moment. This here is a stock description of a learned Brahmin. All learned Brahmins are supposed to be master of the three Vedas, etc. The Brahmin, Brahmayu, heard the recluse Gautama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from a Sakyan clan, has been wandering in the country of the Videhans with a large Sangha of monks, with 500 monks. Now a good report of Master Gautama has been spread to this effect. The Blessed One is Arahant, Samasam Buddha, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, the incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, with its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing. Now he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. It is good to see such arahants. Now at that time the Brahmin Brahmayu had a young Brahmin student named Uttara, who was a master of the three Vedas, uh, with their vocabulary, vocabularies, liturgy, phonology and etymology, and the histories as a fifth, skilled in philology and grammar. He was fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. Uh, so this is another learned Brahmin. He told his student, My dear Uttara, the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from a Sakyan clan, has been wandering in the country of the Videhans with a large Sangha of monks, with 500 monks. Now it is good to see such Arahants. Come, my dear Uttara, go to the recluse Gotama and find out whether the report spread about him is true or not and whether Master Gotama is one such as this or not. Thus we shall know about Master Gotama through you. But how shall I find out, sir, whether re the report spread about Master Gotama is true or not, and whether Master Gotama is one such as this or not? My dear Uttara, the thirty-two marks of a great man have been handed down in our hymns, and the great man who is endowed with them has only two possible destinies, no other. If he lives the home life, he becomes a wheel-turning monarch, a righteous king who rules by the Dhamma, master of the four quarters, all victorious, who has, who has stabilized his country and possesses the seven treasures. He has these seven treasures, the wheel treasure, elephant treasure, horse treasure, jewel treasure, woman treasure, steward treasure, counselor and counselor treasure as the seventh. His children, who exceed a thousand, are brave and heroic, and crush the armies of others. Over this earth, bounded by the ocean, he rules without a rod, without a weapon, by means of the Dhamma. But if he goes forth from the home life into homelessness, he becomes an Arahan, Samasam Buddha, who draws aside the veil in the world. But I, my dear Uttara, am the giver of the hymns. You are the receiver of them. Yes, sir, he replied. He rose from his seat and after paying homage to the Brahmin Brahmayu, keeping him on his right, he left for the country of the Vidyans, where the Blessed One was wandering. Stop here for a moment. So this Brahmayu already uh, very old, 120 years old. Eh? He wanted to uh, find out whether actually this uh, Samana Gautama, uh, he was actually like people say uh, that he was... Uh, Arahan Samasambuddha and possessed the 32 marks of a great man. 
So he asked his student, uh, Uttara, to go and find out. Uh. Traveling by stages, he came to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and looked for the 32 marks of a great man on the Blessed One's body. He saw more or less the 32 marks of a great man on the Blessed One's body, except two. He was doubtful and uncertain about two of the marks, and he could not decide and make up his mind about them, about the male organ being enclosed in a sheath, and about the largeness of the tongue. Then it occurred to the Blessed One, this Brahmin student, Uttara, sees more or less the 32 marks of a great man on me, except two. He is doubtful and uncertain about two of the marks, and he cannot decide and make up his mind about them, about the male organ being enclosed in a sheath, and about the largeness of the tongue. Then the Blessed One worked such a feat of supernormal power that the Brahmin student, Uttara, saw that the Blessed One's male organ was enclosed in a sheath. Next, the Blessed One extruded his tongue, and he repeatedly touched both ear holes and both nostrils, and he covered the whole of his forehead with his tongue. Then the Brahmin student Uttara thought, The recluse Gotama is endowed with the thirty-two marks of a great man. Suppose I were to follow the recluse Gotama and observe his behavior. Then he followed the Blessed One for seven months like a shadow, never leaving him. At the end of the seven months, in the country of the Vidyans, he set out to journey to Mithila, where the Brahmin Brahmayu was. When he arrived, he paid homage to him and sat down at one side. Thereupon the Brahmin Brahmayu asked him, Well, my dear Uttara, is the report that has been spread about Master Gotama true or not? And is Master Gotama one such as this or not? The report that has been spread about Master Gotama is true, sir, and not otherwise. And Master Gotama is one such as this, and not otherwise. He possesses the 32 marks of a great man. 1. Master Gotama sets his foot down squarely. This is a mark of a great man in Master Gotama. 2. On the soles of his feet there are wheels with a thousand spokes and ribs and hubs all complete. 3. He has projecting heels. 4. His long fingers and toes. 5. His hands and feet are soft and tender. 6. He has netted hands and feet. 7. His feet are arched. 8. He has legs like an antelope. 9. When he stands without stooping, when he stands without stooping, the palms of both his hands touch and rub against his knees. 10. His male organ is enclosed in a sheath. 11. He is the color of gold. His skin has a golden sheen. 12. He is fine skin, and because of the fineness of his skin, dust and dirt do not stick on his body. 13. His body hairs grow singly, each body hair growing alone in a hair socket. 14. The tips of his body hairs turn up, the upturned body hairs are blue-black, the color of collyrium, curled and turned to the right. 15. He has, a he has the straight limbs of a Brahma. 16. He has seven convexities. The seven convexities means the backs of the four limbs uh, and the two shoulders and the trunk. He has the torso of a lion, 17. 18. The furrow between his shoulders is filled in, 19. He has the spread of a banyan tree. The span of his arms equals the height of his body and the height of his body equals the span of his arms. 20. His neck and his shoulders are even. 21. His taste is supremely acute. 22. He is lion jawed. 23. He has 40 teeth. 24. His teeth are even. 25. His teeth are without gaps. 26. His teeth are quite white. 27. He has a large tongue. 28. He has a divine voice like the call of the Karavika bird. Uh, 29. His eyes are deep blue. 30. He has the eyelashes of an ox. 31. He has hair growing in the space between his eyebrows, which is white, with the sheen of soft cotton. 32. His head is shaped like a turban. This is a mark of a great man in Master Gotama. Master Gotama is, is endowed with these 32 marks of a great man. Let's stop here for a moment. Now. So these uh, 32 marks of a great man uh, are what the Brahmins believe in. Uh, not sure. So he says the Buddha has all these marks. Uh. I don't know whether it's true or not. 
When he walks, he steps out with the right foot first. He does not extend his foot too far or put it down too near. He walks neither too quickly nor too slowly. He walks without his knees knocking together. He walks without his ankles knocking together. He walks without raising or lowering his thighs or bringing them together or keeping them apart. When he walks, only the lower part of his body oscillates and he does not walk with bodily effort. When he turns to look, he does so with his whole body. He does not look up. He does not look straight up. He does not look straight down. He does not walk looking about. He looks a plow's yoke length before him. Beyond that, he has unhindered knowledge and vision. When he goes indoors, he does not raise or lower his body or bend it forward or back. He turns round neither too far from the seat nor too near it. He does not lean on the seat with his hand. He does not throw his body onto the seat. When seated indoors, he does not fidget with his hands. He does not fidget with his feet. He does not sit with his knees crossed. He does not sit with his ankles crossed. He does not sit with his hand holding his chin. When seated indoors, he is not afraid. He does not shiver or tremble. He is not nervous. Being unafraid, not shivering or trembling or nervous, his hair does not stand up and he is intent on seclusion. When he, rece when he receives the water for the bowl, he does not raise or lower the bowl or tip it forwards or backwards. He receives neither too little nor too much water for the bowl. He washes the bowl without making a splashing noise. He washes the bowl without turning it around. He does not put the bowl onto the floor to wash his hands. When his hands are washed, the bowl is washed, and when the bowl is washed, his hands are washed. He pours the water for the bowl neither too far nor too near, and he does not pour it about. When he receives rice, he does not raise or lower the bowl, or tip it forwards or backwards. He receives neither too little rice nor too much rice. He adds sauces in the right proportion. He does not exceed the right amount of sauce in the mouthful. He turns the mouthful over two or three times in his mouth and then swallows it, and no rice kernels enters his body unchewed, and no rice kernel remains in his mouth. Then he takes another mouthful. He takes his food experiencing the taste, though not experiencing greed for the taste. The food he takes has eight factors. It is neither for amusement, nor for intoxication, nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuance of his body, for the ending of discomfort, and for assisting the holy life. He considers, thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless, and shall live in comfort. Stop here for a moment. Most of these... Uh, what is described here is found in the uh, 75 minor precepts uh, uh, of the monks Patimokkala. All this is concerning conduct, uh, how to conduct oneself, uh, uh, which is also applicable for all samaneras. Uh. When he has eaten and received water for the bowl, he does not raise or lower the bowl or tip it forwards or backwards. He receives neither too little nor too much water for the bowl. He washes the bowl without making a splashing noise. He washes the bowl without turning it round. He does not put the bowl on the floor to wash his hands. When his hands are washed, the bowl is washed. And when the bowl is washed, his hands are washed. He pours the water for the bowl neither too far nor too near. And, the, and he does not pour it about. When he has eaten, he puts the bowl on the floor, neither too far nor too near, and he is neither careless of the bowl nor over-solicitous about it. When he has eaten, he sits in silence for a while, but he does not let the time for the blessing go by. When he has eaten and gives the blessing, he does not do so, criticizing the meal or expecting another meal. He instructs, urges, rouses and encourages that audience to talk purely on the Dhamma. When he has done so, he rises from his seat and departs. Stop here for a moment. So here, after the meal, uh, this blessing uh, is not like nowadays. Uh, nowadays, uh, monks do chanting, uh, blessing. Uh. But in the Buddha's time, uh, uh, the blessing means uh, he gives a short Dhamma talk. Buddha gives a short Dhamma talk uh, to uh, uh, educate the people uh, on the Dhamma before leaving. 
He walks neither too fast nor too slow, and he does not go as one who wants to get away. His robe is worn neither too high nor too low on his body, nor too tight against his body, nor too loose on his body, nor does the wind blow his robe away from his body. Dust and dirt do not soil his body. When he has gone to the monastery, he sits down on a seat made ready. Having sat down, he washes his feet, though he does not concern himself with grooming his feet. Having washed his feet, he seats himself cross-legged, sets his body erect, and establishes mindfulness in front of him. He does not occupy his mind with self-affliction, or the affliction of others, or the affliction of both. He sits with his mind set on his own welfare, on the welfare of others, and on the welfare of both, even on the welfare of the whole world. When he has gone to the monastery, he teaches the Dhamma to an audience. He neither flatters nor berates that audience. He instructs, urges, rouses and encourages it to talk purely on the Dhamma. The speech that issues from his mouth has eight qualities. It is distinct, intelligible, melodious, audible, ringing, euphonious, deep and sonorous. But while his voice is intelligible as far as the audience extends, his speech does not issue out beyond the audience. When the people have been instructed, urged, roused and encouraged by him, they rise from their seats and depart looking only at him and concerned with nothing else. We have seen Master Gautama walking, sir. We have seen him standing. We have seen him entering indoors. We have seen him indoors seated in silence after eating. We have seen him giving the blessing after eating. We have seen him going to the monastery in silence. We have seen him in the monastery teaching the Dhamma to an audience. Such is the Master Gotama. Such he is and more than that. When this was said, the Brahmin Brahmayu rose from his seat and after arranging his upper robe on one shoulder, he extended his hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One and uttered this exclamation, Three times, honor to the Blessed One, Arhan Samasambuddha. That means uh, in Pali, it will be Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samasambuddha Sala. I chanted this three times. Perhaps some time or other, we might meet Master Gautama. Perhaps we might have some conversation with him. Uh, I'll stop here for a moment. So after his disciple Uttara described the Buddha to the, this uh, Brahmin Brahmayu, uh, he was very impressed. Uh, so he uh, extended his, his hands uh, in Anjali, uh, uh, reverential salutation towards where the Blessed One was uh, and chanted Namutasa three times. Uh. Then in the course of his wandering, the Blessed One eventually arrived at Mithila. There the Blessed One lived in Makadeva's mango grove. The Brahmin householders of Mithila heard the recluse Gotama, son of the Sakyans who went forth from Sakyan clan, has been wandering in the country of the Videhans with a large Sangha of monks, with 500 monks, and he has now come to Mithila and is living in Makadeva's mango grove. Now a good re report of Master Gotama has been spread to this effect, etc., uh, etc. Et yeah. then, then the Brahmin householders of Mithila went to the Blessed One. Some paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down at one side. Some exchanged greetings with him, and when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, sat down at one side. Some extended their hands in reverential salutation towards him and sat down at one side. Some pronounced their name and clan in the Blessed One's presence and sat down at one side. Some kept silent and sat down at one side. The Brahmin Brahmayu heard the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan, has arrived in Mithila and is living in Makadeva's mango grove in Mithila. Then the Brahmin Brahmayu went to Makadeva's mango grove with a number of Brahmin students. When he came to the mango grove, he thought, it is not proper that I should go to the recluse Gotama without first being announced. Then he addressed a certain Brahmin student, Come, Brahmin student, go to the recluse Gotama and ask in my name whether the recluse Gotama is free from illness and affliction and is healthy, strong and abiding in comfort, saying, Master Gotama, the Brahmin Brahmayu asks whether Master Gotama is free from illness and affliction, etc. And say this, the Brahmin Brahmayu, Master Gotama, is old, aged and 
burdened with years, advanced in life, and come to the last stage. He is in his 120th year. He is a master of the three Vedas with their vocabularies, liturgy, phonology and etymology, and the histories as a fifth, skilled in philology and grammar. He is fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. Of all the Brahmin householders who live in Mithila, the Brahmin Brahmayu is pronounced the foremost among of them in wealth, in knowledge of the hymns, and in age and fame. He wants to see Master Gautama. Yes, sir, the Brahmin student replied. He went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side and delivered his message. The Blessed One said, Now is the time for the Brahmin Brahmayu to do as he thinks fit. Then the Brahmin student went to the Brahmin Brahmayu and said, Permission has been granted by the recluse Gotama. Now is the time, sir, to do as you think fit. I stop here for a moment. So you see this uh, old Brahmayu, uh, he asked his student uh, to go and uh, announce to the Buddha uh, that he wanted to see him. Uh. So he didn't ask the student uh, to go and pay homage to the Buddha. Uh. Uh, these Brahmins, uh, they think they are superior. Uh. They are the most superior caste. So uh, he didn't. Uh, he just asked the the the, the, the student uh, to uh, uh, ask whether the recluse Gotama uh, is free from illness and affliction, uh, etc. Uh. So this Brahmayu just went and exchanged uh, courtesies with the Buddha and said that the master wants to see. Uh, See him, lah. Then the Buddha said, "Can do. Uh, he can do so, lah." So the Brahmin Brahma, you went to the Blessed One. The assembly saw him coming in the distance. Uh, by the way, just now he mentioned uh, he is the wealthiest Brahmin uh, in this uh, Mithila and the most famous uh, and the most knowledgeable uh, uh, and the oldest. Uh, uh. So the Brahmin Brahmayu went to the Blessed One. The assembly saw him coming in the distance, and they at once made way for him, as for one who was well known and famous. Then the Brahmin Brahmayu said to the assembly, Enough, sirs, let each sit down in his own seat. I shall sit here next to the recluse Gotama. Then he went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and looked for the 32 marks of a great man on the Blessed One's body. He saw more or less the 32 marks of a great man on the Blessed One's body, except two. He was doubtful about two of the marks, and he could not decide and make up his mind about them, about the male organ being enclosed in the sheath, and about the largeness of the tongue. Then the Brahmin, Brahmayu, addressed the Blessed One in stanzas. The two and thirty marks I learned that are the signs of a great man. I still do not see two of these upon your body, Gotama. Is that is what should be concealed by cloth hid in a sheath, greatest of men? Though called by a word of feminine gender, perhaps your tongue is a manly one. Uh, so stop here for a moment. This word of a feminine gender, uh, the Pali is jiva. Jiva is the uh, term uh, for tongue, uh, it, and it is uh, spoken in the feminine gender. Uh. Perhaps your tongue is large as well, according to what we have been taught. Please put it out a little bit, and so, O oh, seer, cure our doubt for welfare in this very life, and happiness in lives to come. And now we crave for leave to ask something that we aspire to know. Then it occurred to the Blessed One, this Brahmin, Brahmayu, sees more or less the 32 marks of a great man on me, except two. He is doubtful and uncertain about two of the marks, and he cannot decide and make up his mind about them, about the male organ being enclosed in a sheath, and about the largeness of the tongue. Then the Blessed One worked such a feat of supernormal power or psychic power that the Brahmin, Brahmayu, saw the, that the Blessed One's male organ was enclosed in a sheath, Next, the Blessed One extruded his tongue, and he repeatedly touched both ear lobes and both nostrils, and he covered the whole of his forehead with his tongue. Then the Blessed One spoke these stanzas in reply to the Brahmin, Brahmayu. The two and thirty marks you learn, that are the signs of a great man, all on my body can be found. So, Brahmin, doubt no more on that. 
what must be known is directly known, what must be developed has been developed, what must be abandoned has been abandoned. Therefore, Brahmin, I am a Buddha. For welfare in this very life and happiness in lives to come, since leave is given you, please ask whatever you aspire to know. Then the Brahmin, Brahma, you thought, permission has been granted me by the recluse Gautama. Which should I ask him about? Good in this life or good in the lives to come? Then he thought, I am skilled in the good of this life and others too ask me about good in this life. Why shouldn't I ask him about good in the lives to come? Then he addressed the Blessed One in stanzas. How does one become a Brahmana? Stop it for a moment. Uh. This word Brahmana uh, if, has uh, two meanings. Uh. One is uh, a holy man. Uh, a holy man. Uh. And it also means a Brahmin. Uh. Originally, uh, the Brahmin caste, the priest caste, uh, were holy men. Uh. All of them uh, were, were renunciants. Uh. But later, uh, they became advisors to the king uh, and they were no longer ascetics, uh, no longer practicing the holy path. Uh. So, so the word Brahmana uh, can either mean the Brahmin caste or the holy man. Uh. In, in this case, uh, he's referring to the holy man. Uh. How does one become... Uh, so if, if I refer to the holy man, I say Brahmana. If I refer to the Brahmin caste, I will just say Brahmin. Although in Pali, the two words are the same. How does one become a Brahmana? And how does one attain to knowledge? How has one the triple knowledge? And how does one become a holy scholar? How does one become an Arahant? And how does one attain completeness? How is one a silent sage? And how can one be called a Buddha? Then the Blessed One spoke these stanzas in reply. Who knows about his former lives, sees heaven and states of deprivation, and has arrived at dead birth's destruction? A sage who knows by direct knowledge, who knows his mind is purified, entirely freed from every lust, who has abandoned birth and death, who is complete in the holy life, who has transcended everything, one such as this is called the Buddha. When this was said, the Brahmin Brahmayu rose from his seat, and after arranging his upper robe on one shoulder, he prostrated himself with his feet at the Blessed One's feet, and he covered the Blessed One's feet with kisses, and caressed them with his hands, pronouncing his name. I am the Brahmin Brahmayu, Master Gautama. I am the Brahmin Brahmayu, Master Gautama. Those in the assembly wondered and marveled, and they said, It is wonderful, sirs, it is marvelous, what great power and great might the recluse Gautama has for the well-known and famous Brahmin, Brahmayu, to make such a display of humility. Mm, stop it for a moment. Huh? So you see, huh, initially this Brahmayu, huh, he thought huh, he was a very famous Brahmin, huh, refused to pay respect to the Buddha. Huh? But when the Buddha said uh, that the Buddha has finished his work, uh, can see his former lives, can see heaven and hell, uh, uh, and destroyed birth, and the cycle of birth and death, uh, and is a Buddha, uh, then he, he accepted uh, that the Buddha was speaking the truth. Uh, then only uh, he was willing uh, to humble himself uh, and pay respect to the Buddha. Uh, a lot of people are like that. Uh, uh, and they're new to the Dhamma, uh, they find it very difficult uh, to pay respect, uh, but when they understand the Dhamma, then only uh, they are willing to humble themselves. Then the Blessed One said to the Brahmin, Brahma you, Enough, Brahmin, arise, sit down in your own seat, since your mind has confidence in me. The Brahmin, Brahma you, then rose and sat down in his own seat. The Blessed One then gave him progressive instruction, that is, talk on giving, dana, talk on virtue, sila, talk on the heavens. He explained the danger, degradation and defilement in sensual pleasures and the blessing of renunciation. But he knew that the Brahmin Brahmayu's mind was ready, receptive, free from hindrances, elated and confident. He expounded to him the special teaching to the Buddhas, suffering, it, dukkha, its origin, its cessation, and the path. Just as a clean cloth with all marks removed would take, would take dye evenly. So too, while the Brahmin Brahmayu sat there, the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dhamma arose in him, 
all that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. Then the Brahmin, Brahmayu, saw the Dhamma, attained the Dhamma, understood the Dhamma, fathomed the Dhamma, he crossed beyond doubt, did away with perplexity, gained intrepidity, and became independent of others in the teacher's dispensation. In other words, uh, he uh, attained stream entry. Na. Then he said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama, Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright, but had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge, and to the Dhamma, and to the Sangha of monks, from today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. Let the Blessed One, together with the Sangha of monks, consent to accept tomorrow's meal from me. The Blessed One consented in silence. Then knowing that the Blessed One had consented, the Brahmin Brahmayu rose from his seat and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he departed. Then when the night had ended, the Brahmin Brahmayu had good food of various kinds prepared in his residence. And he had the time announced to the Blessed One, It is time, Master Gotama, the meal is ready. Then it being morning, the Blessed One dressed, and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went with the Sangha of monks to the Brahmin Brahmayu's residence and sat down on the seat made ready. Then for a week, with his own hands, the Brahmin Brahmayu served and satisfied the Sangha of monks, headed by the Buddha, with various kinds of good food. At the end of that week, the Blessed One set out to wander in the country of the Videhans. Soon after he had gone, the Brahmin Brahmayu died. Then a number of monks went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and said, Rebel Sir, the Brahmin Brahmayu has died. What is his destination? What is his future cause? The Buddha replied, Monks, the Brahmin Brahmayu was wise. He entered into the way of the Dhamma, and he did not trouble me in the interpretation of the Dhamma. With the destruction of the five lower factors, he has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. That's the end of the Sutta. So here, you see, uh, when somebody is new, uh, comes to the Buddha to learn the Dhamma, the Buddha teaches him uh, this graduated discourse uh, consisting of nine things. Uh, first is the uh, dana, uh, charity. Second is sila. And the third, uh, because of dana and sila, a person goes to heaven. And then fourth, uh, after he enjoys himself in heaven, uh, then the Buddha explains uh, the, uh, this, uh, the danger, uh, the degradation, defilement in sensual pleasures, uh, how the, the vanity of sensual pleasures, uh, how it is never satisfied. Uh, uh, and then after that, uh, the blessing of renunciation, number five. Uh, uh, then after that, uh, when the Buddha sees that the person is ready, uh, then the, the, it's followed by the four noble truths. Uh, uh, so five plus four topics, uh, that's nine topics. Uh, uh, these nine topics uh, we have tried to copy uh, in our book, uh, Message of the Buddha, uh, for Thor the Lunin. Uh, so this, uh, at the end of the, after hearing the Dhamma, this uh, Brahma Yu uh, became, uh, took refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. In other words, uh, he changed his religion from uh, being a Brahmin, uh, one of the Brahmin, although he still belonged to the Brahmin caste, uh, but instead of following the Brahmin religion, uh, now he followed the Buddha's religion and uh, became a disciple of the Buddha. Uh,